I, the only music of his that I really like really heard is the soundtrack to that um the insult the thing? T- that, yeah TFW no GF <laughs> damn I haven't heard that is it good I, I, it's fine it was good in the movie like it worked like it was very appropriate music for the did you watch it Mm-mm, not yet I, I wanted to but then it was taken off streaming services or whatever to be like oh we're we're gonna wait to you know, get funding for this or something but yeah, I've, I've, seen, it, I've seen her talk about it though um I mean, you probably don't need to watch it. I, I feel like you've spent enough time online to already know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I just reek of insult them to you. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I was talking. Um, I I, li- I listened to a couple of your podcasts. It's great. Awesome. Thanks, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I checked out the uh, the one that when you were on Charlie's live stream. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, yeah. that was fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Water. Mm-hmm. Um. Tight. Well. Any questions or anything before we start yapping? No, I like this uh, this flow chart you put together. This <laughs> is like infinitely more research than I, I ever did. For, and you uh, printed it out. Yeah, dude, I'm like, I got like a professional office situation here. That's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, cool, man. Well, stoked to chat about your album and stuff. Uh, so, I mean, if anybody listening, coming in, eventually uh, Jeremiah Simmerman with me right now, uh, clarinetist, electronics, uh do you call yourself like a multi-instrumentalist or composer or just uh, read? Or? yeah i mean i don't but i probably could you gotcha. know um at least you know like on the last couple of records i've done i've played more than just woodwind instruments but you know i wouldn't you know like i play synths but i would never describe myself as like a synth player or like keyboard player or anything or just variations on the clarinet do you do bass clarinet too i have one i play i don't I don't practice it enough to like do it publicly. Let's say that. Gotcha. But yeah, I'm looking at it on the shelf right now. It's <laughs> like staring back at me, giving me a dirty look. Yeah. Well, uh, the way I always start these is asking people about coffee and how yeah. coffee fits into your life. And, yeah. uh, you know, if it does, or if you have a different beverage you like that makes you go up or down either mm-hmm. way. Well, I actually quit drinking recently alcohol. Okay. Uh, so like right now, like my coffee intake is like through the roof. Like every time I take a piss, it smells like a fresh fucking pot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, like my coffee routine is like pretty deep. I actually, um, when I was uh, age nineteen to twenty one, I worked as a barista, um, and it was at, at a place that actually was like very serious about about coffee culture. And, and this is long enough ago that it, it isn't quite like it is now where you have like baristas who are like sommeliers, you know, where they know like the viticulture and the, you know, the, mm-hmm. you know, the farmer's name and all that shit. But, but enough that like a lot of the fundamentals I learned about coffee making, I still, even though like, so if my coffee routine is, for every morning, um, I have I have a Chemex if I'm making more than one cup I use. Um, but generally, I'm just making one big cup for myself. Um, and I'll use, I use this OXO, like one cup pour over that's like really great. It's kind of like the clever coffee concept, oh, but without yeah. the like the release. It just has like a really nice slow drip built into it. Yeah, cool. Um, and so, but like, as far as like fundamentals, like I always drink coffee out of glass, like never out of porcelain, just because it, it, it somehow drinks cleaner to me that way okay um i fresh grind for every cup that i'm making um i always heat the glass before i put the coffee into it um but after that like it's it's pretty low brow like i don't go for like like the single origin intelligentsia counterculture stuff um i get my coffee there's a coffee roaster in new york called puerto rico and they've been in new york for like over 100 years and it's like perfectly good coffee it's not you know, it's not going to be entered in any competitions with like, you know, latte art, but and handlebar mustaches and stuff. Exactly, yeah. no, no suspenders, <laughs> and you know, I'm actually using the OXO, uh, not the single cup thing, but like the the big boy brewer, the auto drip. Yeah, and it's pretty nice. Yeah, it, it's great, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I I don't the coffee culture thing, at least here in New York, has gotten to like that level of like pretentiousness that I think Portland had on lock, you know, (laughs) 15 years ago. Um, And a lot of that stuff, like whatever, and and I'm sure you could speak to it more. And I'm sure this is like, you know, I'm sure there's like, it's, it's comparable to the world of natural wine where I've spent a lot of time where like you really kind of have to be ingratiated 
and have like a, a, a much broader context to understand and appreciate it than like the layman. Mm-hmm. But a lot of that like counterculture intelligentsia stuff, like that single origin stuff for me is quite often a little too bright, a little mm-hmm. too acidic. Um, I, I don't, I don't think I'm like have a cerebral enough appreciation to like to to um, my palate doesn't really get much beyond the acidity and the brightness of it. I feel that. Um, it's funny, like I, I you know, ask everybody about their coffee habits and uh, Ben Maunder, who's like you know, my, my dude, he uh, was saying like, oh yeah, I just drink Bustelo. Yeah. And I've turned to that because uh, like I, I'm not really active in the coffee industry now. So I'm like, oh. yeah, let's get this roast on. Like, let's yeah, get yeah. Put some caramels up in here. So Have you, are you, are you a Bustelo guy? I am currently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, I've got a weird thing with Bustelo. Like when I first, you know, I've, I, the whole time I've been in New York, I've lived in the Lower East Side, which is like a really specific part of, of, of the city. And, you know, historic, or at least for like the last like 60 years, it's been heavily like Puerto Rican, Dominican um, population. Not as much now, but like when I first moved here, I started drinking Bustelo right away. And I always have some in my house. Like it, I feel mm-hmm. like, like it's, I don't, I don't know what you compare it to, but it's like, definitely some like hometown pride totally yeah yeah it's good stuff i mean like yeah it's it doesn't seem to ever age so no (laughs) well yeah it always tastes like it was roasted like 50 years ago (laughs) yeah but in another 50 years it'll still taste like at that same level Mm -hmm. of freshness yeah Yeah. ability to time travel it's pretty pretty impressive but i can't i mean i used to drink coffee like i mean i would drink 10 cups a day and now i really just kind of do like uh, like a bit, you know, again, I'll put it in one of these, I think this is like a, maybe a 16 ounce glass. I'll have that in the morning. And then maybe later in the day I'll have like an espresso or another cup, but I'm a little like my, my, uh, my tolerance is like not, not what it once was. Yeah. Do you is just, there, do you, do you go all day with coffee? I kind of like, I try to, like, if I'm thirsty, I try to be like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get some water in here. Like this is 98% water. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, I remember when I worked at that cafe, you know, this is over 20 years ago at this point, but one of the guys, like one of like the like elder baristas, he saw me like pounding coffee after coffee. And he was like, look, man, if you're getting tired, just hydrate, drink some water. Like it'll actually invigorate you more than like the 18th cup of coffee. And I think it's true. I I think you're right. And I think that I still have some sort of poisonous macho sort of barista thing that I can't get over. So (laughs) yeah, 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 yeah. So you, so you're not in the coffee game anymore. Not right now. No, I'm just I'm trying to get the music uh, career back yeah. on track. And yeah, you know, uh, you know, you can only do so much stuff in coffee. Like uh, I'm sort of like the nerd. Like I, I shine the laser through the coffee and tell yeah. you the the total dissolved solids and the extraction and all. But um, yeah, I mean, not right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you know, the, I, I don't work. I, you know, I've worked in restaurants forever up until recently. And the last restaurant I worked at um, had like a really serious coffee program. Uh, and, you know, so much so that you could only touch the, um, the espresso machine if you were certified trained by these guys from, from counterculture. Okay. And, you know, a couple of times I had to do the training and like every single time I, I was fighting to not like roll my eyes at everything. <laughs> this woman, she was like, you know, t- like showing me like how I should like position my body to tamp down the espresso and i was just like jesus christ like was this like katie cargulo I, is, does she look like a goblin <laughs> <laughs> i haven't seen her in a while I, I don't think she looks like a goblin but she's like I, she's like that tall she's like three feet tall and, mm, no, i feel like she's like a, a, a pretty normal looking individual <laughs> no th- this person looked like they you know like you you scrape them off the bottom of your shoe walking out of portland like <laughs> Uh, yeah i don't i don't know yeah but it's just you know like i get it and like if you're you know if you're working on like you know if you're like learning to play a woodwind like you need to work on your posture you need to work on like your breathing totally but um you know i i guess yeah i'm just hydration is good yeah i I should try it but um cool man well that's a that's a good answer uh yeah some people have bad ones i'm just like okay we're moving on Uh, (laughs) i mean i could talk coffee and wine all day uh so yeah, you might need to like push the direction. Um, I, I did notice that on that bungle thing, you were drinking wine. And I was like, mm-hmm. am I going to have to break out the booze for this one? But, um, you know, I mean, three weeks ago. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I've yeah, I've been like I've been off booze for three weeks now. And uh, 
you know, like I said, I've been hitting the coffee harder, but yeah. Nice. And so that doesn't make you too like unleveled by being like extra caffeinated and like not uh you know, chilled out enough. <laughs> well, I think I've been I've been like heavy enough of a drinker for long enough that I think there was just constantly a lot of like natural sugars circulating in my system. Gotcha. So now that I'm not drinking wine every day, like I think I'm just kind of tired all the time. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, well, I guess we can talk about citadels and sanctuaries <laughs> if you want at some point. Uh, yeah, we can talk about whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm down for it, man. I don't right. have to be anywhere. Beautiful. Well, um, so I mean, I scoped out your album, and it's I, I love that's like a, a perfect album to sort of go over you more broadly as well as you know the album itself. Mm. Um, but for listeners tuning in, it's like a coming of age album. You're saying and sort of like pays tribute to a lot of composers that you look up to, trying to inhabit their space. These are like, you know, Morton Feldman, Alvin Lussier. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I feel like half of the people I'm very familiar with, half of them I'm not so familiar with. Okay. Um, and so I'm curious, first of all, what is the shit to check out from uh, Tony Scott and Bill Smith? So Bill Smith, um, you know, he's kind of a mysterious figure, I think, for a lot of people because he really had like three kind of distinct careers. Uh, I mean, first and foremost, he was a master clarinetist. Um, and, and I don't use that word lightly when I say master mm -hmm. because, you know, within the musical tradition um, of the clarinet, you know, there's very few people who can very uh, seamlessly and naturally kind of straddle the different worlds um, of jazz, <clears throat> excuse me, of classical, of contemporary composition. Um, it's really like, you know, for for most musicians, for most clarinetists, it's like you got your area of focus. Uh, and he was like a really rare case where he did these things um, so much so that I've got a copy of it here somewhere. There's this book that came out in the 60s called um, New Directions for Clarinet by this uh, composer, Philip Refelt. And it's, it's like the Bible for contemporary composers who are looking to um, do different extended stuff with the clarinet, stuff that is, you know, unconventional and doesn't. You know, you, uh, composers were actually building these new written languages for it. And it was a comp when it first came out, it was accompanied by this record of a clarinetist demonstrating all these different techniques. And it was William Smith. Okay. So in the classical world, um, he worked under the name William O. Smith. And he was, you know, really a first call guy for, for not, not just um, composers who were looking for, for a clarinetist to perform their work. But for, you know, for academics that were really trying to sort of codify and solidify this, you know, this new language, you know, on the page. Um, and then beyond that, he was just like, I, I mean, I think he's the most swinging clarinetist I've ever heard. He, you know, most people would probably know him for, he spent a lot of time playing in the Dave Brubeck quintet. Mm -hmm. um, but he made a record and I have turned on. Like it blows my mind how many like heavy musicians I've mentioned this record to have never heard it, and I'll send it to them. And I'm talking like heavies. I'm talking like John Zorn, Evan Parker, like heavy mm -hmm. heavies. And I'm like, you got to hear this fucking record. It's called Folk Jazz, and it's this quartet record of um, Tim on B flat clarinet, Jim Hall on guitar, beautiful, Shelly Mann on drums, and then I'm 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 spacing on the bass player, but um. Like if you're into that Jimmy Jufri thing of sort of like twangy kind of like country jazz, it's that like times a million. It's just, I mean, he has like such like a buttery slick tone on the clarinet, just perfect intonation and just breezing over the changes, like with so much style and grace. So, you know, even though his own work under his name, his work under his own name isn't like super documented, it's actually pretty limited. Um, and you kind of have to, access different like academic resources to find some of it mm -hmm. when you hear the guy play it's just like i don't know like what i could compare it to it's like when you hear prince sing or something or you hear like um fucking hendrix playing the, the guitar you're just like this is what this guy was was here to do um so the record folk jazz without question it's not right. the easiest thing to find and if you can't find it let me know i'll send you like a rip of it um it's just it's the highest level the absolute highest level um so that, yeah, that would be, you Thanks. know, but, okay. oh, sorry. But the third thing beyond that is that he was, for years, he taught at Cornish College in Seattle. Oh, cool. So there's a whole school of clarinetists that have come up under him 
you know, like some of the like most thoughtful, baddest clarinetists around spent time with Bill. And there's a lot of like, you can go on YouTube, there's all kinds of um, videos of his like master classes and stuff. And he's just this like really beautiful, you know, he just died in 2020 at like, he was like 90. Okay. But he was active a real long time and just had this really beautiful, like soulful way of communicating, not just musically, but like interpersonally. Mm hmm. Um, yeah. do, are you a hip to like Hadley Kalman? That's the only other person that's coming to mind from Cornish. Um, no, I feel like he was like Dexter Gordon's protege or something like that. Uh, okay, he's an alto player. Okay, um, that's the only like Cornish bell that's. I'm, yeah, I'm from yeah. Tacoma, so it should be ringing all the all the oh, bells. So, yeah. You're from Tacoma. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's wow, but <laughs> well, I just got a new pair of boots in the mail from Spokane. Okay. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a nearby. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, but then Tony Scott, like you know, he initially was another one of these guys who you know he kind of came up in the. Um, he first started getting known like the late forties, early fifties as just like a killing swing clarinetist, you know, just bad motherfucker, you know. Um, and then at some point, and a lot of people, I, I've heard people credit Tony Scott with sort of inventing new age music. Um, mm, okay. Because he made this series of records, got a copy of it over there. Um, music for Zen meditation and music for yoga meditation. Uh, Zen meditation came out first. I think it was like 1958. And he traveled to Japan and made these improvised pieces with traditional Japanese musicians, people playing koto. And then he went to India and made a duet record with sitar, clarinet and sitar. Whoa. <laughs> um, and they're just like fucking amazing. Yeah, I'm sure like, that, I mean, in my mind, like sitar and clarinet, it's like, whoa, that's a timbral mix bag. But like, I, I mean, I'm sure that if you have two, uh, you know, killing people playing together, then like they blend. Oh, it's so gorgeous, man. Like his, like his clarinet almost doesn't even sound like a clarinet. Like he's got such a mat, you know, because, and I'm, I'm like, not like super, like, I, I can't talk about this stuff that formally necessarily, but you know, if you're talking about like, traditional Hindustani music and Carnatic playing. If you're talking about, you know, Japanese music, you know, they're thinking well beyond 12 tones. You know, there's mm. all kinds of like super strict microtones. Um, and you can, I, I don't know how deep he got into that stuff formally, but you listen to him play, he, he's not playing out of tune. He's playing these really soulful passages that, you know, the intonation is just like, it's like this beautiful serpent, you know? Nice. Uh, in this new directions book that you mentioned, does it cover mm -hmm. like quarter or not quarter tones, but just like microtones in general on the instrument? Yeah, and a lot of it's from the perspective of the physical creation of those sounds. So, I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with like how a clarinet works, but unlike a saxophone, it's not just keys. You actually have tone holes. Okay. So you know, a lot of it is sort of like instructing the clarinetist, like this, you know, how you sort of run your finger over the tone hole. You know, Western music, it's up and down with a little bit of articulation. Um, but, you know, if you're trying to get those microtones and really trying to create them precisely, you know, what, how you sort of adjust your finger over the tone hole is going to be really precise. Hmm. And so when you say like the microtones here, um, I mean, is it more like quarter, third, like, is it, you know, 17 uh, TET or whatever. Yeah, see, that's right. When I, when I was saying I can't talk, I, I'm not equipped oh. to talk about it that technically. <laughs> I thought you meant about the clarinet thing. I was like, I'm sure you got it, dude. <laughs> You're clear. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I can, yeah, yeah. I, I, I might, yeah, I don't want to embarrass myself. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm curious. Uh, I'm like, I will, a while ago I got into this dude, and I'm curious if you're into him, Naftul Brandwine. Oh, like yeah, it's amazing. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, enough Tuli Brandvine. Yeah, yeah. You, <laughs> um, yeah, he's like, I mean, he's one of the two, uh, like, plasma clarinet masters of the 20th century. It's him and um, Dave Terrace. Okay. They were around at, like, roughly the same time. Naf Tuli is, like, more of, like, a uh, Louis Armstrong figure, and then I guess, like, Dave Terrace would be more of, like, a, maybe, like, a, 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 Char a Dizzy Gillespie. He's, like, a little okay. bit later, but enough that you know, they probably cross paths. Word. Yeah, so do you listen to that stuff or is it just like you have respect for it or you're, you've been aware of it in the past? Uh, or, I've, like, I, I've listened to it, you know, and it's definitely like, I've listened more to people um, like David Krakauer and Ben Goldberg who, you know, are a generation before me. And therefore when they were coming up, that stuff was sort of closer to their, 
to them, you know, because that was like another maybe one or two generation before them. Um, but it is, yeah, if you listen to like Naftuli Brandvine and, you know, I never, again, I never really studied Klezmer formally, mm -hmm. but as a basic structure, you know, the way Klezmer sort of works is that it's, it's not like jazz where you have like the heads and then you blow over, you know, and, you know, play a solo. Like Klezmer is really about like ornamentations, mm -hmm. you know? So like yeah. the way you play the melody is where you kind of like, how you, how you style it up is like, you know, what makes you, you. And certainly those guys like created that language, Interesting. Okay. you know, much in the way that like Sidney Bechet fucking created, you know, jazz. It's funny. Like, you know, you talked to Tyshawn Sori previously mm -hmm. and I, I listened to that interview and I saw somewhere years ago, he had a list of like, these are some albums and like half of it was Klezmer. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, I noticed that. I, I don't know Tyshawn that well, but I, I remember seeing that like he was like, teaching a class at like a Klezmer workshop. And I was like, I didn't know that that, that was, but I mean, Tyshawn is one of those guys that can literally digest any musical information in, in a moment and, mm -hmm. you know, create, you recreate it like a master. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I've seen him do it. Like I, I, I there's, there's some, you know, that guy's on another level. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very impressive stuff. Uh, okay. So who else is on this album uh, in terms of, uh, the people that I don't know, I, I'm, I guess the, yeah, you I know, the, oh, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, spectralist dude. Uh, yeah. what's his name? Uh, Hor Hor is this Horatio? Uh, I mean, I, Horatio, I mean, uh, I'm, uh, he's not alive, but I'm sure he would correct me saying Horatio would probably, you know, Horatio or something like this, but yeah, Radulescu, man, like the, the Romanians, like him and Dumitrescu are like the G's. They, um, yeah, I mean, so you haven't you haven't checked out Radulescu? Um, I've heard a little bit of uh, Dumitrescu. Is mm -hmm. that the other? Uh, I've yeah. heard a little bit of him, and I, I'm much more familiar with like uh, other sort of spectral you know, dudes, like you know, uh, Grise or like Mirai, like the French but, guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, sp I, uh, spectralism. I, I, I have a feeling any music we talk about, I'm going to have to start by saying like, well, I don't really know what the fuck I'm talking about, but, um, you know, one of the things I really like, uh, that, that I really respond to with the music of say Radulescu, um, and then Dumitrescu as well, who I don't know that, Dumi, you know, Radulescu, I, I think described himself as a specterless. Dumitrescu is still alive. I, I think he actually sort of resists that, mm. that label. Um, but one thing that's interesting to me about both those guys is, you know, when I first started hearing about spectral music and sort of like trying to seek it out before I even really knew, um, you know, how this music came together or really what the term spectralism meant. And like, maybe I still don't really know what it means, but I got a very different feel from Radulescu than I got from, say, Griset or, or Mirai. And like, no disrespect to those guys, but that music always felt um, like more formal to me. It feels a little mm -hmm. more like a... Um, like aristocratic almost. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, and something about the music of, of Rad, I mean, it's, it's, I think, largely obvious, but it just feels like kind of more like, m not messy in like an informal way, but just like a little, like a little rougher around the edges, a little more fucked up, uh, a little more based in something um, like primal, you know? And I don't mean that to sound like, mm -hmm condescending in any way yeah, yeah, it just, it, it's like i feel it more you know and so then you know when i go beyond that and i started reading interviews with radulescu and, and sort of how he he constructed his music you know just like my favorite director of all time you know he, he always says like it's about feel first it's like it's you know this is and and you, when you look at his personal history you know he left romania and moved to france like i always just got the feeling that radulescu um and i'm this is pure conjecture but that like radulescu and and Dumitrescu are like outsiders, mm -hmm. you know, that they're sort of like, they know, even though Radulescu moved to France, became a French citizen, died in France. Like, I think he kind of probably always knew that he was an outsider, you know, and that inherently speaks to me. Yeah. There's something about like outsider art or any sort of creativity that comes from that realm instead of, you know, like you said, like the formal, like, like somebody like uh, Pierre Boulez, I like, I love him, but like, there is something where you're just like, dude fucking like leave us alone like yep uh, like i know that you have so much funding to do all your fucking experiments at earcom or whatever but like right uh, 
Yeah. Well, so there's, I mean, do you know the viola player, Garth Knox? Mm -mm. Man, you got to check him out. He's like, I mean, he's this amazing, you know, inter he's probably, I think Garth is probably like in his 60s now. Um, and he's like, you know, this amazing contemporary violist with like a real um, area, like his, his real focus is spectral music. And he's got this record called the Spectral Viola. It's amazing. It's just like he's interpreting all these pieces. Um, and so I kind of found my way into Radulescu through, um, through Garth Knox. And when you hear these, I mean, if you, if, when you hear these pieces, like it doesn't, at first you're just like, is this guy just playing like three notes really intensely for a half an hour? <laughs> That's like, kind of, but then it's just like within that, it's almost like that, um, that Earth Realm record that you and Charlie were talking about where it's oh, like, OV? that, ah, uh, yeah, that record <laughs> is like, one of the like clicky, yeah. yeah, it's like top 10 shit to me, but I hear, I hear, um, the Radulescu stuff very similarly way to the way i hear that that orth realm um it's really like trance inducing it's really um like i i really love getting lost in these like micro gestures that repeat repeat sort of slowly evolve and you know before you know it like you don't know if five minutes passed or a half hour passed totally yeah yeah, and you can hear all the like, just like the thing, like you said, with like the Mick, you know, the Mick Bar or Throne thing, where you, you start to hear like this clicking of the, the the pick against the pickup, and you pay attention to that, and you kind of get lost. Like you can hear that with a lot of Radulescu's music, whether it's like the clarinet or like string, you know, his string quartets. You start hearing all this like extra musical material that sort of like takes your focus away for a bit, um, and it's just this really intense listening environment. Rude, yeah, and yeah. I mean, when you did your piece on uh, citadels and sanctuaries, citadels and sanctuaries, uh, I mean, forget which one it is, maybe it's the uh, uh, Radulescu one, but it like has this fucking like, yeah, <laughs> that like it's such a a piercing sound, um, yeah. Uh, so I mean, you said I think somewhere that that's like a pedal something mm -hmm. or other. And I'm curious to know just about generally what electronics means to you. Um, is like, is that like applying a bunch of processing is it like are you doing like algorithmic procedures ever or yeah. like uh like how like what does that world mean to you i mean it's it's an evolving thing um when i you know the first time i started experimenting with using pedals and electronics within um an improvisational situation with my clarinet it was literally like a microphone plugged into one of those stupid um green line sixes you know, this is like 2005 or something like that. And it's been this like this, this ongoing process. And it's sort of like, I could point to like specific, uh, like benchmarks. Um, like I made this solo record, uh, in 2007, 2008. And the, the record, the purpose of the record was to have a solo clarinet record, um, where I don't play any conventional material. It's all like <laughs> sounds and, and, uh, extended technique and then heavily edited within pro tools. Okay. Um, so there wasn't like any formal, like that was like the end of the formal, um, concept behind it. Uh, and it's, you know, it's all, it's all like very intuitive, you know, I start working in, so the, the record, sorry, I'm like going all over the place, but the record was like 10 pieces of just heavily micro edited information. You know, one, the last piece on the record has something like 10,000 edits in it. Oh damn. So it's just like, you know, all this like shit flying by as fast as possible. And I would spend like hours, you know, work just to get like. 12 seconds of music yet it took me like almost a year to make this record oh. <laughs> um and so that became like a really like in doing so that sort of i i, I sort of like for myself codified this like studio language of like post-production that i used on many subsequent records um right. but with, with the with as time passed i kind of became less interested and less reliant upon this like hyper um post-production realization of music and i, I became you know more sort of reinterested in just like improvisational language, improvisational relationships with other musicians, and really, you know, having the bulk of the music take place before you start mixing it, you know, <laughs> perhaps as you should. Uh, and and al along the way, you know, my the thing that was always really challenging for me was I did not have there wasn't a conversation happening between this post production thing and what I was able to do. Um, live mm. i spent like okay. years trying to sort of like figure out how to make have them be a little more consistent with one another um and so i've really spent like 
you know, now my my clarinet electronic setup is like I have all kinds of shit dialed in. You know, I got this this uh, this beautiful there's this guy in Bulgaria who makes these clarinet pickups that I, again back to Bill Smith. As far as I know, he was like the first guy to use them. This thing that like drills into the barrel of your horn, um, so you get like a really direct signal to send to like effects pedals. Um, so, you know, going back to that piece that you're asking about, like, yeah, the clarinet's going through this one crazy Japanese pedal I have that is just a glitch pedal. You know, you, you play something, you click down on the pedal and it starts, you know, you can, you can adjust the, um, the rate at which the, that, that glitch is happening, you know, um, but it's like, it's really like a simple device. And, mm. you know, that was like, I, that piece is actually me playing straight through. There's like no post-production or overdubbing on that at all. And it's hilariously on the record. It's the piece that sounds the most like chopped and screwed or whatever. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah, man. It's a, it's a really interesting uh, sonority for sure. And like, I don't know that I can listen to it around uh, a certain type of person, but um, no, yeah. <laughs> no, no, that piece is not for everyone, but I feel like I, you know, that that was one of those pieces where like, you know, I, I had I had like a I was in the studio for a month, you know, working on that record and some other records. And so I would I, I was like spitballing shit all day and I started making that piece. I got like a sound going. I was like, wait, this is sick, this is sick, this is sick, you know. And I did a couple of passes. That pass is the one that made it on the record. And I'm listening back to it in the studio and it's like, I think Radulescu would have dug this. Like I I, I don't feel like I'm <laughs> Like I'm, I'm, I'm definitely subconsciously as I play that sort of evoking Radulescu, but like I feel like I have to believe that if he, if these types of pedals were available at the time, that he would have at least found them interesting. Totally, yeah, interesting. Okay, I mean, who can say? But uh, so the the only other person that I don't really know of these uh, heroes of yours is Nate Woolley. Hmm. But he's he's like contemporary, right? Like he's yeah, he's one, he's one of my best friends. Word. Um, so, I mean, I, I checked him out a little bit years ago and then, like, recently again. And, like, it sounds like he's sort of, like, post-jazz-ish. Like, I mean, like, uh, extended technique-y, but, like, still something. I don't know. Maybe you should tell me. <laughs> oh, I mean, Nate, Nate's got um, lots of different worlds that he lives in and has, has lived in and, and sort of, um, you know. So, I met, I met Nate in 2003, 2004. Um, and, you know, at the time, you know, he's a few years older than me, uh, but we were, you know, pretty fresh to New York and we were performing. There used to be a guy, he's not alive anymore, uh, named Butch Morris. I don't know if you're familiar with Butch, but. No, it sounds familiar though. And he was amazing. He was this phenomenal musical thinker. He, uh, he developed a system called conduction, which was a way of. Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Butch, you know, his, his thing, you know, he, he was this amazing cornet player, actually. Uh, he didn't really touched the horn much after like the late eighties, but you know, he developed a system that, you know, he could work with a small group of improvisers, uh, quite often. And the, the way that I played with him was with large groups where he could conduct the improvisers to create these musical structures. Um, and I met Nate playing in that group. Um, but you know, over time, you know, Nate has gone on, you know, he's, he's done lots of jazz playing. You know, he grew up a jazz musician, like literally like playing on his daddy's knee kind of thing. And I don't feel like I'm talking out of turn by saying that he's definitely got some like hangups and sort of like demons that haunt him from, you know, jazz pedagogy. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, but, you know, he, he's you know, this incredible jazz trumpet player. He's, you know, he's incredible noise musician, you know, playing through amplifiers and shit. Um, in the last few years, he's been um, uh, doing a lot of like interpretation of contemporary. He just, this record just came out of him doing this Ania Lockwood piece. Um, so he's, he's, and he publishes this amazing journal called Sound American, which is like, you know, he, he sort of commissions different musical thinkers to, to write these pieces based on a theme for each issue. Uh, he programs festivals. He's just this really active, um, really humble, beautiful, soulful guy. And, you know, and yeah, the piece that I dedicated to him, he, uh, and this is a friend. I've made n numerous records with him and played mm -hmm. concerts. Um, someone described his solo trumpet playing with amplifier as exquisitely hostile. <laughs> okay. 
And it's just like, it's the most beautiful. I, I fucking wish someone would have said that about me. Cause you know, <laughs> I'd like to snatch that, but you know, I, I think it's like totally like a perfect way to describe what he does. And, you know, specifically what he does with the amplifier is like, he's built a new language for trumpet and noise amplifier. It's, it's amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Um, what, what's like the, the record to check out of his, uh, for myself and other listeners? Uh, he might disagree with this, but I think his first solo record called wrong shape to be a storyteller. Okay. Is really special. And it's a I great think title that, too. Yeah. Well, when that it came out in like 2005, he literally recorded it in like the attic of his building into like a mini disc. And it's like super, it's just one hour long piece. That's like super quiet. Like so, It's like, he was really into like that, um, lowercase shit at the time. Lowercase. You know, you know lowercase. Uh, uh-uh. uh. I, it's I, I'm <laughs> lower. It was, I don't know if people are, do you know the record label erstwhile? Mm-mm. Oh man. Um, oh, so, <laughs> th- th- yeah, there's just, there's this whole scene of, imp- uh, of improvisers. Um, some notable people would be like Keith Rowe, guitar player who would probably again, resist the term lowercase. Um, this incredible group, uh, called Imperine, which is Greg Kelly and Baha Brainy. Um, and, and you know, to, I'm going to give like the dumbest, quick description of lowercase as possible but it's like super quiet like incre- okay. like like you, if you showed up at a lowercase concert you might walk in and say like it looks like there's a concert happening but i don't hear anything <laughs> just the tiniest micro gesture i mean the t- like if you did if you just if a normal person walked in off the street they would think they were in a mental institution <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm saying it's just it's like literally little so it's like the music's are really durational it takes like it's spread spread out over a long time the sounds are just like every little sound matters interesting okay uh, it's, it's funny how there's like you know there's such an arms race like especially in guitar it's like who can play the fastest? it's like uh, and like uh it's funny to see the arms races sort of become like weird shit like who can play the quietest and like <laughs> oh yeah i mean lowercase really had its moment in like the early 2000s um and there's you know still people that i you know i don't know if people still identify with the label necessarily but it was like obviously it was never huge but there were plenty of time you know plenty of concerts i went to and played where like you had like 30 people in a small room like totally wrapped audience and like they were really like erstwhile in particular is the label that is like sort of like the like you know it's like the blue note of that shit and the people that are into that stuff, you know, they talk about it like wine or, or coffee or it, it's like, it's like a real connoisseur's music. Okay. Yeah. Just scope it out. Yeah. I mean, like, is it that the type of thing that you have to really be at a concert for? Or is it like, I mean, the records are, I, I think it works. I think it, <laughs> I think it works better on recording um, okay. because you can really give it a focused listening How are you know, headphones or on a loud stereo, you, you know, uh, but that's, that's my take. Mm-hmm. You know, I, 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 I want to be as close to the sound as possible. And in a physical space, you know, you, you can't always really control that. Well, I guess uh, that's a kind of good segue to um, the realm that I do know, which is like starting with Morton Feldman. And yeah. It's like this kind of like very quiet, uh, drawn out stuff. Um, and something that I, I dig about him is just like, I mean, A, the just the attempt to be like, I'm changing the scale of the music. Like I'm doing some fucking three hour pieces. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's such a crazy vibe because I mean, I, I was taking this uh, post tonal analysis class in college, and the guy was like a, a Zen monk. Uh, hey, where did you where did you go to school? At USC. Okay. Um, I forgot the dude's name, Robert something or other. Um, but he was like a, a Zen monk, very old, and he was just saying like, you know, at these Feldman concerts, it was just like by the end of it, it was only the monks, and yep. uh, that's I mean, that's a dedicated practice to be that composer man yeah 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 it's uh, you know my my you know elliot sharp the guitar player yeah i know of him i, I don't yeah. know him personally <laughs> but you know, he's my neighbor he lives in the building across the street uh he he studied under morton feldman in buffalo as a young man and um he's you know he, he i think he published one or two stories because it wasn't like a totally pleasant experience you know he was this sort of like larger than life figure who would hold court and sort of command the room and, you know, was very sort of charismatic slash obnoxious, I think. Interesting. Um, and he, I think he actually had 
you know, I'm, I'm saying this secondhand from, you know, I know a couple of people that got to, to study with him and I've, did you ever read his book? Um, give my regards to eighth street. No, no, I've heard of it though. Yeah. Amazing. Highly recommend. It's, it's, it's a collection of, um, of lectures. It's not like he didn't like, you know, write shit, but, mm. um, I, I think he had like pretty dogmatic ideas. Uh, you know, El Elliot told me this story about, um, and I hope I'm not talking out. He published the story. So whatever, uh, you know, he was doing one of his like senior recitals or something. And, you know, Feldman was either his advisor or he was in charge of him in some capacity. And in the piece, Elliot, Elliot had um, some improvisers at different like points in the piece. And Feldman walked up to him. And he's like, he said, you know, where are the music stands? And, and Elliot said, well, these guys are improvisers. They don't need music stands. And Feldman stopped the concert, grabbed some music stands. Ooh plopped him down in front of the improvisers and said, now you can start. Man, yeah, that's with an audience and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's funny, um, with uh, Elliot Sharp, like, I feel like, you know, as a guitarist, I've been aware of him by name plenty, but um, in my mind, like, I'm such an Elliot Carter head, yeah. and Elliot Carter has his guitar piece shard, and so I feel like I've always just been like, yeah, like... It's something's <laughs> just <laughs> intertwined. Yeah, Elliot Carter shard, like, Elliot Sharp. I'm just like, shit, this is too many uh similar sounds for me you should, you should check out elliot man he's deep he's got like an intimidatingly large catalog totally but he's definitely got like a, an incredibly unique language for guitar i think I've, I've seen him do some stuff with like henry kaiser and that yeah. dude um alvaro do you know that dude uh, alvaro, alvaro domine yeah yeah i know alvaro good good guitarist <laughs> yeah yeah he can play definitely yeah, um, um, but but Feldman so. is is just like without question like if I had to like grab some desert island composers musicians thinkers like without question like he's coming with me. It's it's kind of funny also that you mentioned him being like larger than life because that's totally why I've heard. But then the, there are a bunch of interviews or not interviews but like uh, conversations between him and John Cage on YouTube, and I feel like he always like I expect him to kind of do the thing where he's like I'm going to be the one that's like going to cut you off and like try to like whatever but he's just like uh, letting john cage do his kind of like quiet like slow delivery and he'll just be like what else john <laughs> it's like yeah. whoa that's how i was expecting yeah i think i mean i i'm pretty i'm fairly confident that when they met even if just by a few years cage was the elder cage was the more established cage was sort of you know um senior to him mm -hmm. so I, I think those dynamics don't don't die you know mm -hmm. like I, I have people that i've known for 20 years and i'm still like you know all right you're the boss mm -hmm. you know what i mean totally uh, i've also seen him talking to elliot carter though and i feel like he's uh, meanwhile carter's scoffing at him but like uh, uh he's like you know just kind of like well this is what I mean, we need the three hour pieces and carter's like, no we don't <laughs> um, yeah i felt uh at some point i gotta pull it up but i i feldman like was like deriding the 20 minute piece he was like we got enough 20 minute pieces we don't need any more 20 minute pieces mm -hmm. and it is really funny how quickly uh, uh pieces sort of automatically just default to being 20 minutes somehow mm -hmm. like it's kind of the magic number uh if, for you as a composer or improviser do you feel like you always just kind of let a piece end up being how long it is or do you like i'm going through this phase where i'm like literally trying to make uh, like 1800 second pieces uh, to be exactly 30 minutes. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So I'm like trying to like, you know, crunch it down to the, the millisecond. Uh, wait, wait, wait. What's the number on that? It's 1,000 pieces. Or 1,800 seconds uh, for 30 minutes. 1,800 seconds is the equivalent of 30 minutes? Yeah. It's like 1.8 million milliseconds, I think, is 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so how many pieces would that be within the 30 minutes? Uh, I mean, like, so I guess what I'm trying to do is just have it be anything that fits into there it could be one piece it could be yeah. 30 pieces um so yeah i'm trying to like have it you know get an algorithm where i don't have to fucking make decisions so <laughs> yeah I, I, yeah i mean i would say like one of my life's great challenges is and will continue to be my relationship to time when it comes to music mm -hmm. because my natural instinct almost always is to rush things mm -hmm. and it's something i uh, uh, pretty much always immediately regret if you know not shortly thereafter you mean like rush the process like the creation process or rush the duration of the like you know get the piece to be quicker 
if I'm if I'm in an excuse me, if I'm in an improvisational situation with other or even with my yeah, if I'm if I'm improvising, I always push through too fast. I always have this like nervous tick going that I feel mm-hmm. like perhaps the other musicians or the listener is getting bored. Uh, I'm always sort of questioning like I just played that thing twice, you know. Should I not even have played it once, mm-hmm. you know, or should you I play played it? your licks? <laughs> yeah, if I should I play it ten times? Like to me, I mean, I uh, I'm perfectly happy to listen to someone play the same fucking thing with minor variation for a half an hour, you know. Mm-hmm. But getting myself to be able to commit to that myself has continued to be a challenge. Somehow it feels like some I don't know. It's like this feeling like I always got to be somewhere. I'm always running late or something. Uh, do you feel like? I mean, if somebody was to be like, you know, Jeremiah, give me a, a, a 35 minute piece. Do you, would you approach that as like, I'll try to do something until it comes out to 35 minutes or like, would you go top down more and try to like break it up? If without shitting on anyone, I feel mm-hmm. like, like many people my age, um, you know, a lot of us you know, kind of came into these different worlds of adventurous music through the music of John Swain. That's, mm. you know, that's just, it's just is what, you know, he's a large figure. He's, you know, very prolific. And, you know, there's a million entry points and exit points to these different musical worlds. Um, but I, I think like his way like of, of approaching music, these blocks where like, it's literally moment to moment thing, everything is just changing. I know for myself to get closer to the music that I want to make, I need to like really unlearn and get away from that kind of thinking because it doesn't serve what I want to do. And it doesn't feel, doesn't feel like anything I want to listen to anymore. Gotcha. That type of thinking, meaning like uh, having like a target duration. Having a target duration. Well, no, not necessarily that. Um, I don't want as much information as possible in a short amount of time as possible. And I sure. certainly don't want to listen to or do anything that I would describe as clever. <laughs> you know, like if, if there's like one musical like trait that I just want to completely like get out of my system as a perf- performer and listener are these like clever turns of like, you know, jumping from one motif to another or, you know, referencing something that kind of gives you a moment to like have a chuckle. Like I just don't want that shit anywhere near me. Yeah. I mean, in my mind, that's like a, a callback in comedy or something. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, yeah. I mean, who, who's somebody that in a pejorative sense is a clever composer to you? Well, Zorn. Zorn. Okay. You know, I mean, and I, 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 I say that, I'm trying to say that like with, without any yeah, disrespect, yeah. you know, but it's like, he has been this like larger, this incredibly large figure whose influence is like, you know, like all encompassing. And there was a time in my life where like that music was like, you know, it was a fucking revelation, you know, and it totally blew my mind open and was this like entry point, all this amazing music that, you know, I cherish, but it's just, it, you know, it, it, with, with improvised music um, specifically and specifically with like group improvised music, like so often it seems like it, it's like a closed system. Like even if people say, Hey man, let's, let's do some improvising. You kind of, it's an improvised gig. You kind of already know roughly what's likely to happen you know mm-hmm. what the what the arc of the pieces will be how long the set will be um you know what how you're going to respond to certain kinds of gestures and you know what gestures you're going to use to respond to those things and some you know at least in new york it, it became really prevalent where like people were just jumping from idea to idea mm-hmm. and i just i don't know man like i i, I I, I just I don't I don't want that at all anymore. Totally, you want um, cohesiveness, or I mean that that stuff can be completely cohesive. And again, you know, look to Zorn, like he's got that shit locked up, you know. But um, it's just I, I I want what am I trying to say here? Like I I don't I don't find any peace in it. I don't find any comfort in it. I don't find any like honestly, I don't find any discovery in it. You know, like discovery to me is like what happens when there's enough room for the unexpected to happen. And, you know, if you're throwing ideas at a wall, you don't, ha- you could throw the same idea at the wall a hundred times before you have a revelation, or you could throw a gazillion, you know, and it's like just chaos. But, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want that shit. 
So I feel like you're kind of like a connoisseur of like sort of, you know, these more free uh, improv improvisational worlds of music. And for me, I'm much more of like a dictionary guy. Like I feel mm -hmm. like I'm like in the Maunder sort of lineage of like, I'm going to fucking know all the permutations of these four notes um, yes. or like the Carter tradition or whatever. But um, I, I guess like maybe that's like, I, I love Ben doing free improvisation, but um, I feel like it's always something that I've not necessarily been comfortable with. And I could probably be great at it but um like how do you feel like that whole process goes of like like if we were to like improvise together like what do you imagine that sort of connection of uh musical things to like be like in your head like well i have each other out yeah 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 yeah. i mean i haven't heard you play so mm -hmm. um but <laughs> uh you know if if the last five to 10 years of music making for me has been like marked by anything consistent. It's that I'm trying to get rid of, of habits that I've built trying to, like I said, slow myself down. So yeah, if you and I sat down to play, I would probably wait for you to make a gesture. Mm -hmm. um, I would, my default tempo would be slow. My default dynamic markings would be kind of light. Um, mm -hmm. That's just where I'm at right now. I would be, more interested in um like acoustic phenomenon like uh mm. um you know beating tones and 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 stuff that kind of happens in like an extra musical way mm -hmm. um and i would try to meet that's something that's always important to me with improvising is to like honor the language of the other person so you know i wouldn't expect you I would want, I would feel best about myself and best about the musical situation if I could, you know, come to you just as much as you come to me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not fair to, well, not fair. I don't know about fair. It's just like, it's just not yeah. interesting to me to like blow over someone. Uh, so you also, you know, you have the 5049 podcast and that's, you're quite prolific in that. Had, and, had past tense, had. Oh, had, 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 had. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, when I was listening to it, I was like, you know, appreciating that you have like, I feel like you have a little bit more, uh, you're a little bit more of a smooth host than I am. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> uh, I imagine that, you know, like there's some grace in being like, okay, let me listen to what you have to say real quick. Like, you know, as mm -hmm. the other improv improviser, I don't know, I'm struggling with that word. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and so like, there's gotta be some overlap, just, just like conversation improvising. Um, but like how many, like, you know, besides like the sort of like, oh, it's going to be quiet and I'm going to like feel you out. It can only be like, what, like, like three to five different sort of trajectories right um i don't know you know like i made uh you know our mutual friend charlie you know he and i made a duo record um just before the pandemic we recorded it in la in like fe late january early february 2020 mm -hmm. um and you know i've known charlie you know we met when we were 13 yeah. um so i've known him for years and we have a, a, a musical relationship we have a personal relationship but, you know, we got into the studio and, you know, sort of pretty quickly, I kind of like uh, began, very, I'm saying this very lightly, sort of producing the session, which was like, you know, we sat down and had an idea going and it's like, all right, let's just focus on, you know, let's do like a Chelsea thing. Let's like, let's let long, long tones sort of ring out, you know, and we record a couple of pieces like that. And then, you know, I looked over, there's, there's a piano in the studio, I'm like, Charlie, man, jump on the piano. And he's like, well, I'm not a piano player. I was like, well, just fucking do it anyway. Play a couple, like, just play one chord and just play it over and over again. Um, so that was sort of like an exciting and fun way to like shape the session. And that's kind mm -hmm. of more like uh, in line with what I'm, you know, there's plenty, I mean, there's plenty of places in my musical thinking and musical mind that are like, I would say antithetical to like a pure improvisational approach and philosophy because i think like free improvisation like all music but you know it has um like a, a philosophical aspect to it that mm -hmm. is like crucial to the production of the music and you know there's plenty of great improvisers who can fucking play their ass off and but you kind of know exactly what they're going to do the second you go to the show the second you hit play on the album and that's cool, but it's sort of antithetical to, I think, like the core spirit of, of improvisation, which is, you know, you, uh, do, do you know this guitar player, Joe Morris? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, NEC, right? Yep. Yeah. Joe is, in, in my estimation, like 
master improviser. You know, mm. like it's it's his, it's it's his life's work. You know, um, and when he talked, I've played with Joe a few times. It's always great. And um, you know, Joe always says like, when I'm playing music, I don't want to know what's going on. It's like I just always want to be in a situation where I I'm lost and I'm trying to to find my way to the other person. And mm -hmm. it's like that that's 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 a philosophical perspective. That's totally. that's a life philosophy. That's not you know get on stage and fucking blow the audience's mind, which is you know what um, a lot of people do. So, um, like you know, I was talking to Fred Frith one time. I think on the I don't know if this was a private conversation or it was on the podcast. I can't remember, but. I remember he said something, it was like so simple, but he was like, yeah, night after night, I never set up my pedals the same way. <laughs> He's like, because I want that aspect of, of, of indeterminacy and, and having to discover new ways. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, man, interesting. Uh, what's his face? Uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Joel, Joel Harrison. So his name guitarist. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I interviewed him and, uh, he, I know he talked to Fred Frith. Uh, but it's kind of interesting uh, to hear about guitars from other people that don't play guitar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, I mean, but, you know, Fred is another one who's just this, like, master improviser. He's, mm -hmm. You know, and so, yeah, I would say, like, like what's really interesting to me is, and I, I probably wouldn't have said this 10 years ago, but I want to hear someone who uh, has been building, like, one or two things over the course of a lifetime, not doing everything. You know, mm -hmm. like, I, I don't give a fuck about that. Like, I want to hear, you know, like Evan Parker, who is, you know, my hero and has been developing this language for this. Like he reinvented the language of the saxophone. And, you know, over the course of 50, damn near 60 years, like, it's been this really singular focus. And, you know, the end result is music to me that, like, transcends the ether and is this, like, it's it's not about, like, Sorry if I'm like speaking like in hyperbole, but like that that music's not about this world. That music's about communicating. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I don't know if this is for people listening. I'm pointing up. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't about you know that music ain't about man. That music's about the big man. <laughs> this is a strictly atheist podcast, though. Um, <laughs> well, then you're talking to the wrong guy. But I'm, it's something, it's not, yeah. I uh, no. I, you're, an, you're an atheist. I, I mean, just uh, just by uh, you know like. You know, I, I carry a card, of the yeah. atheist club. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I, I don't really uh, care anymore, though. I just was hardcore when I was young, and uh, yeah. I sort of like like to still rep it. Um, it's kind of interesting, though, that uh, your breath piece is for Mario Diaz de Leon instead of yeah. Evan Parker, because uh, I feel like I think of Evan Parker as like the breath wizard. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that's a, a reasonable assessment, but I mean that's a, uh, a musician certain, that doesn't it, use breath. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean certainly part of his repertoire. I mean Evan, you know among the many contributions he's made to the language of the saxophone, I mean, you know, people circular breathe before him, but his particular thing is like the masterclass. Word. Um, yeah. I mean, so, do, do you know Mario? I, I don't know him, uh, but I mean, I like, I have heard his music plenty of times and uh, I, I'm aware of his place in the scene and stuff. You should, you should, man, I don't want to like tell you how to do your, your job, but you should get him on here, man. That's someone sure, who yeah. has a lot of interesting ideas and, you know, is really beautiful and articulate. Yeah, and I mean, his compositions are super beautiful too, in a way that's like, you know, it's, you know, these days I feel like they're such a like, oh, yeah, I'm a modern composer. And it's like, yeah. he doesn't sound like that. It's, it doesn't sound like it's like at all not modern or contemporary, right. but um, it doesn't feel like it has to like prove how modern and futuristic it is or anything. No, no. Again, I mean, I, my, my, my belief on Mario is that he's working <laughs> uh, with something bigger in mind than, um, hang on one second. Yeah. Might be. <laughs> Is that your dinner? No, uh, mail came. Uh -huh. It was knocking all out. Um, uh, I didn't want to be sitting here like, <laughs> bye. <laughs> right. Um, so I should close this door too, so people don't see my house number. All right. So we're at Evan Parker and the big guy, the big man, the chief, the chief. <laughs> um and mario yeah I'll, I'll definitely invite him that sounds like a, a yeah. 
a great conversation I have. Um, so when you say like the big guy and, you know, like I heard you in the your podcast with Justin Fry uh, say like sort of looking upward Then you mentioned vertical tension. And so like, are you on this slaughter dike uh, tip too? <laughs> I see. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty, you know, I'm, I would say I'm like uh, a soothes dilettante. You know, like mm-hmm. I have to read this shit. Like it's it's not a tough, an easy nut for me to crack, but you know, it's definitely like when I crack those nuts, you know, there's vistas of uh, of truths that that, that resonate with me. Uh, I'm definitely, um, uh, the the. I mean, I, I don't know how coded. You know, I, I feel like I, I suspect that you and I probably share some similar ideas about the modern world. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and sort of the more time I spend in uh, the modern discourse, you know, the less time I want to spend in it. And mm-hmm. the more time I want to spend looking to things that I, to which I ascribe uh, some aspect of the sacred. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the whole thing of discipline, like, I, I guess I was, like, I totally agree with you. And like, I, I, when you were doing that podcast, I was like, no, fucking get preachy, dude. Like, if not yeah. for everybody else, for me, like, yeah. I, I'll, yeah. I'll listen. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Cause my woodshed is definitely not what it used to be back in the day. Sure. Not, I like, I, I'm all about that. And so, uh, I don't know, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this discipline stuff and like yeah. woodshedding and actually I mean, having standards. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, by nature, I think I'm like actually a very undisciplined person and, you know, kind of, you know, I, I don't, you know, to use like a, a therapy term or like an AA term, like I don't show up as much as like I could or should. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is, I don't, Let's see what can we say about this. Um, I mean, my relationship to to my horn, and I don't even consider myself a wood like that's like some self doubt shit. But uh, you know, I, I have a hard time even thinking of myself as like you know a clarinetist. You know, like that's hard. Really? Yeah, just, you know, it's it's some philosophical shit. But you know, I have friends like you know my friend Josh Rubin. He's like he lives in L.A. Actually, um, like master of clarinet you know he plays uh clarinet for the international contemporary ensemble i can do anything you know and like we're friends we're colleagues and like i play shit with him and i'm just like are you you're not seeing through me right now <laughs> like i guess but but the thing but the relationship to the horn is what's really important to me um it it's having you know i think i think you know, and no disrespect, I don't mean any disrespect to like people that don't play acoustic instruments, mm-hmm. uh, but having a relationship with an acoustic instrument that requires this uh, sort of physical rigor mm-hmm. um, is as important, <clears throat> excuse me, as important to me as any sort of like spiritual practice, um, be it meditation or, or prayer and reflection, these things that are also important to me. Um, because like in very concrete terms, you can sort of always it, it, it's it's like a a good way of understanding like myself and where I'm at um, on a trajectory is like how my my relationship with the my, you know my how my embouchure is doing mm-hmm. you know if you know my my clarinet's in the shop right now so when I pick it up in a couple of days and and I start playing like my embouchure is going to be a little fucked it's going to be a little non responsive. Um, the clarinet itself and, you know, kind of circling back to, or re-referencing, you know, this, this vertical tension thing, you know, the clarinet itself is an instrument and like guitar is this way. Uh, all, all of these acoustic instruments are this way that it's about re- resistance, mm-hmm. you know, like to, 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 in, to have a tone that's rich, to have a, a harmonic language that's rich. You really, what you're dealing with is resistance. You know, the way I set up my mouthpiece with the reed and the ligature and, and all these things to really get to a place where the sound that's coming from the horn um, that's simultaneously pleasing to me requires rigor and it requires building a certain amount of resistance. You know, you, you don't want to play on some flimsy ass reed right. that is immediately responsive. You want to play on a reed that like, you know, mm-hmm. you got, you got to, you got to kind of like, you know, like break the buck a little you know what i mean you gotta like Mm -hmm. it it requires something and 
So having that relationship and having like this, you know, in the shed, having this like really clear, if you're listening, if you're paying attention, like this really kind of clear understanding of what your, your, your limits are, of what your shortcomings are mm-hmm. and like looking yourself in the eye and be like, no, I'm going to work on that. Like, this isn't good enough. This needs to be better. You know, it's actually mm-hmm. like, you know, it's not like, you know, being a war veteran call to arms, but it's like a personal call to arms mm-hmm. of like, I want to be better at this. I want to be able to communicate with other musicians in a way that's meaningful. If I'm just like fucking around on the horn, you know, like I wouldn't dare do that with another musician for whom I have respect. Like I want to bring something to the conversation that has, you know, a basis in rigor and a basis in thoughtfulness and a basis in, you know, a couple of years of listening with years of playing. And, you know, if by no other virtue, by virtue of the, that very thing, it's, it's, it's meaningful. And um, it, it, it keeps you honest, you know? Totally. Um, I'm curious. It's like I was uh, like earlier today, I was sort of just like talking shit to my wife about uh, Leo Brower, the guitar composer, uh, because his compositions are so guitaristic. Like it's like the instrument comes before the music in a way, and like I'll I'll throw some shade at Leo Brower. He's he's got enough acclaim to like I don't, I don't know him. Okay, he's just like the the Cuban classical guitar composer of like like he's like the dude. Um, yeah. I'm like I'm all Dusan Bogdanovich man. Uh, right. Uh, so for uh, somebody like Brower doing like these compositions where it's like, yep, if it's on guitar nicely, um, that kind of irritates me. I'm curious if there's even such a thing as like clarinetistic music uh totally totally yeah okay yeah and like i don't fit into that world and Mm -hmm. you know i I don't say that with i'm saying that without like self-deprecation it's just it is what it is you know like i don't i I can't play like that i'm not gonna play like that it's not gonna happen for me in this lifetime you know Mm -hmm. I'm, i'm aware of that you know um that ship sailed but you know fortunately i've got enough um of an idea in place that I can kind of like answer to my own sense of, of virtuosity, which, you know, I, I, I believe has some foundational structure and integrity. Mm-hmm. Oh, I have to believe it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, wh- I mean, what, what does your woodshed look like these days? Um, besides your horn being in the shop? Um, these days it's looking a little rough. Uh, I, I, we re- we renovated our, our apartment over the summer. So things are still kind of like, um, space wise coming together. Um, but you know, the, honestly, the, the woodshed for me is, it, it's always sort of changing. Um, I, I, I hmm. right now it, the woodshed is empty. I haven't, <laughs> been, in, I haven't been in there much cause I've been sort of like reconfiguring my studio. Uh, so a lot of my woodshed these days is sort of like, working on how my all my electronic components are patched in um you know building like a a studio with lots of electronic instruments there is sort of this maze puzzle aspect to it how do you how you want to like optimize it for workflow Mm -hmm. and so that's you know sadly you know it's not a very um satisfying answer but that's you know at the moment that's where the woodshed is but but no actually i take that back because i've actually been sitting at the keyboard every day um like playing not this type but like i guess they both look like that but you know, yeah not, like a like a i mean it's a midi controller you know it's, but it's, not a computer keyboard <laughs> not a computer keyboard but actually okay. at like you know playing you know scales on the on a quote-unquote piano mm-hmm. okay and kind of just trying to you know expand my harmonic language in uh kind of like a more conventional way Interesting. Okay. a little bit of ear training you know i feel like uh for me like i i I'm so seduced by like the researchy type stuff. And like, you know, you're talking about like your signal flow of pedals and stuff. Like, I feel like that's like nearby that. And I just get so seduced by like learning more stuff and yeah. like never actually doing the athletics of like getting the fingers on the fretboard. Yeah. Uh, so like, uh, I've just always eschewed athletics entirely. And so it's, it's crossed over into the guitar realm. Now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so one, one, two, uh, a couple of constants that are always, in the shed for me um you know long tones long tones Mm -hmm. um i think you know for woodwind players you know long tones are really like if you don't practice anything else practice long tones um practice playing notes evenly you know Mm -hmm. you will you will never not benefit from that um 
practice. And then, you know, so if I have like 15 minutes of practice, 20 minutes, yeah, I'll play long tones for a while, play a couple scales. And, you know, if I have time, you know, maybe I'll try and like learn something by ear, you know, like usually like a, like a standard. Um, and then I'll try and, uh, and I'll just play free for a while. That's what feels really good. But, you know, to play free with any sort of proficiency, like you really need to dial in mm -hmm. the, like the fundamentals of the instrument, the, the sound production. I mean, I feel like also having like dialed in ears is essential, but like, you know, that must, like, I, you already have that, but do you work that ever into your routine? Like, uh, like becoming more sort of, uh, keen with your ears and I mean, I have a long way like to intervals, go, but <laughs> no, I mean, I have a long way to go with that. Like I, it's so funny, like the amount of time, um, I spend fucking around with my phone, you know, <laughs> to actually like just open up the app store and be like, oh, there's all kinds of apps for ear trades. Yeah. <laughs> like all sorts or this, of shit or oh there's a metronome on my phone like oh maybe i should practice with that. <laughs> Dude, yeah 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 practicing is like the least sexy thing ever and it's i'm i'm, I'm incredibly self-conscious about about when i practice so being you know in a one-bedroom apartment it's a little tricky mm -hmm. you know because i don't want my wife works from home and you know i don't want to like you know annoy the shit out of people or feel like i am I, i'm in a similar position um However, I, I guess for shits and giggles, I'll show you yeah. my rotating. This is my computer is on a little uh, like desk that's on a wall, and I am yeah. turning this like a fucking secret. Oh wow! Now we're <laughs> got the whiteboard, uh -huh. Ornette picture. Yep. <laughs> yep. So this yeah, I've got. Woodshed. Yeah, well, I actually one thing I do in my woodshed. I'll show you something. Hold on. I always have uh, different pictures up frame pictures uh so like right now above my desk you know there's a framed picture of takamitsu beautiful uh, so yeah um so I, I try to change those out pretty frequently uh i've got a picture of duchamp back there uh i've got interesting yeah like i try to change these things out pretty frequently but i like having those like i like having those those guys watch me totally yeah yeah um I, I, you're a big ornette guy right yeah definitely What's your favorite or not? Uh, I don't have one favorite. Uh, I mean, it's, I guess like I probably, maybe it's like a boring answer, but like the period that came just after shape of jazz to come is sort of the stuff I go back to most often, um, purely for enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Um, the town hall concert, the trio record is like an absolute tear jerker. There's that tune on there called sadness. Do you know that tune? Mm -mm. Oh, like it, it rips my heart out of my chest every time I listen to it. Um, it's yeah, sadness by Ornette is amazing. Um, I, I I like the primetime stuff. I don't listen to it as much as it seems like everyone's like these days. Like in New York, <laughs> like it seems like everyone's trying to do a version of a primetime band. Mm. Um, I mean, I love everything by Ornette. Like he's I I don't know that like even that record he made in like two thousand six, uh, Sound Grammar. Mm. It's fucking um, awesome. Mm. It's the two basses, drums, and Ornette, and it's just like Ornette just being very good at being Ornette. <laughs> yeah, uh, I forget what the album is right now, but um, what's the the double quartet thing? Uh, I want to say it's just free. Free jazz. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm I'm such a big uh, Scott LaFaro dude, personally. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Charlie Hayden as well. I forgot that that was Scott LaFaro on there. Yeah. Did you see? There's this documentary out now called uh, Fire Music. Hmm. Uh, oh, dude, uh, Scott? No, no, it's a documentary bet. by this guy Tom Sergal, who uh, is a, a a drummer in New York. He, he plays a lot. Uh, he plays a band called um, called Whiteout with his wife Lynn Culbertson. He plays a lot with like Thurston Moore and, and Willie Wynette and Sonic Youth guys. But he just spent like over ten years making this documentary about free jazz. It just came out, and it's like it's spectacular. I cannot recommend it highly enough. And awesome. There's a lot of really good interviews in it with Bobby Bradford, who was supposed to like, you know, something, I don't know why someone, I've talked about this like on a million podcasts and like, I don't know why someone hasn't written a book about this, but the jazz scene of Fort Worth, Texas from like, that, that started, uh, uh, so, for some reason, there's a group of musicians born, all born in the late twenties, early thirties in Fort Worth, Texas who are like the best jazz musicians of the 20th century. It's like Ornette Coleman, John Carter, Bobby Bradford, 
um, Ed Blackwell, like just like the motherfuckers, mm. all came out of Fort Worth. Interesting, huh? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, anyway so, I didn't know that. Ornette was from Fort Fort Worth. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So Bobby Bradford is in this documentary, and he's uh, he, he talks about how like he was he was in school at the time, I think in in, in California or in Texas, and Ornette called him for that date to play on that on that record, and he was like, ah, I can't. I have like finals or whatever. <laughs> He's just like to this day, like, why didn't I do that record? <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, I, I totally passed up the uh, the segue opportunity when you pulled out that picture of Takamitsu. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, I guess like as a guitarist, I'm sort of aware of him through like you know Equinox and um, mm-hmm. was it Towards the Sea? Yeah. Um, which are both beautiful pieces. Um, what's your connection, or like, what's uh for like a clarinetist? What's your jam with him? None. I, uh, I mean, I just, it's just, it's, it's, it's beautiful music. Um, there's this piece in particular, uh, I think it's called the night I twas the wind, you Mm -hmm. know, this, Mm -mm. oh man, it's like this 13 minute long piece with harp, um, percussion and, and violin. And it's just like, it's just like such like an ignorant thing i'm about to say it's probably such a disservice to all involved but it's like the most i'm not even fuck it it's it's if if you <laughs> like you know that piece why patterns by feldman uh, why as in not the the letter why but, but like, the question like, like why patterns gotcha. yeah uh it, i I, I, well. I hear it as like a very like a more romantic version of that okay really beautiful really sensual really like um no i just love i just love takamitsu's music gotcha I mean, yeah. like I, I, I do too, but I don't quite know how to put my finger on what it is that I like. Um, but, I mean, it definitely feels a little bit more like, feels like more like poetry than prose mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. Like it's like more gestural, more kind of like, um, like a little bit more like comfortable with ambiguities or something. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. He. Um. I. I think again, you know, like a person could derive just as much meaning from from his writing or there's this, there's this amazing book called confronting silence and mm. similar to that Feldman book. I think it's actually just a collection. It's not necessarily essays. It's more like a collection of lectures that he gave. Um, you could read that book and never hear a note of his music. And I think, <laughs> I think be just as moved. Like it's just this really beautiful sort of um, sparse writing that, you know, there's, there's no fat on it. It just it sort of like distills these ideas about music. And this like really like, I don't want to say it. it sounds like so cringed, but like it, it, it's very Japanese. Let's just say that it's very <laughs> like there's, there's no wasted words, you know. Gotcha, um, man. I feel like you're like the connoisseur of the fucking music uh, library or something. Like uh, when I was at USC, I would go to the library and like be like, oh yeah, here's all this stuff. But it was like mainly in the scores. But I feel like you, yeah, you have the the book books on on point. Oh man, I mean, yeah. There's I have a lot that. Uh, This is the Takamitsu book. I would so highly recommend this. Word. Like, I would say if I had to pick like five books by or about composers, I would definitely throw this in there as like a first call. Awesome. I'll have to scope it out. Yeah. I just, I just have this little book of music theory essays with fucking Milton Babbitt jacking off onto the page. So, is it, but I mean, is that stuff like how inviting do you find that writing? Not at all. I mean, like, right. it's, like literally the first sentence is like 70 words and you're like dude fucking we get it man you have a vocabulary (laughs) but i love milton babbitt like he's fucking great but it's just like dude like stop trying to prove something (laughs) yeah i mean that's like you know for me in the last few years you know i've been hoarding all these like really intense like critical theory books you know i'm like i'm looking at my desk right now it's like what's the difference in repetition uh simulacra and simulation uh, and you know, it takes me so long to find any entry point to so much of this stuff. And I have to like reread it and reread it. And like, maybe I digest like a page or two and, and then maybe in like a year or two, something will click and I'll be like, Oh yeah, let me go reread that thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but like when those light bulbs finally appear, it's just like, feel like you're not crazy. For sure. Yeah. You're, you're, you're like a big theory guy, right? I, I like, yeah, maybe too much. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm big into 
the theory stuff, but at the same time, like, you know, everybody now, like the whole like buzz or, or buzz, uh, yeah, like the catchphrase is like, you know, music theory is racist. And it's like, well, it's not even a fucking theory, <laughs> you know, uh, like, yeah, like it's like the acousticians, like the physicists have figured out this shit already. I'm just the musician that's trying to apply it. And so to call right. that theory is kind of ridiculous. Like, I'm, I, I'm not trying to explain why it, it exists or like what it should be or something like that. But. Yeah. So like, let's, let's like, as a culture choose to dismiss or look away from however many years of research and like applied research to that, that has like opened all kinds of doors of understanding mm-hmm. for <laughs> what exactly? Yeah. And I mean, I dismissed the fucking like the European stuff long ago and just like, you know, like I don't listen to Mozart or something like it's not that interesting to me. <laughs> Have you spent much time with that stuff or you just were like, I'm at a different place. Like I don't like I can get down with like your Scarlatti's, your box, uh, like all that type yeah. of stuff, like the early stuff. But like, I don't know, like Beethoven. Like, right. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I hear you. I feel like early music is well worth spending a lot of time with. Absolutely. Yeah renaissance music and, and and vocal music you know my show or whatever like that stuff is well all at you know to use a contemporary term be evergreen <laughs> uh and then you know the 20th century stuff's amazing but yeah a lot of uh i don't know how much mozart i need yeah and also i mean going to like usc and like being like it's funny they wouldn't let me test out of uh for, like first year theory uh huh. even though i got the test like totally aced or whatever but it's like i have to learn their like you have to say a minus instead of a, a or you have to say M I N instead of a minus sign or like you can't use a triangle for me. It's like, dude, this is fucking labeling stuff. Wait, um, so as so as to be to be more consistent with like seventeenth century music or no, no, no. Century? I mean, it, with like jazz stuff. I mean, uh, right. it, like to say like a minor seven chord. Like they were like, no, you have to write out M I N seven. And it's like this is not important to me. I don't think. Uh, right. I, I do like to sit around and move numbers around. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's more more my jam. Yeah, but then what about like critical theory? You spend a lot of time with that stuff, like not music theory, but I mean, I honestly don't really know what that means. Like, I feel like when people say theory, they mean critical theory, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I I love me some philosophy. Like, uh, I yeah. can talk about uh, fucking like modes of consciousness or whatever. Like, uh, you know, the my death metal project is a limitivist because it's like a limited a limited materialism and like you know i'm interested in all that world but not yeah. so much this like like even the stuff that like charlie's into and like deloys or whatever i'm just like what are you trying to say man okay so you like ginger and stuff like more than other types of foods like uh-huh. you like rhizomes okay yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna get hate for this though so <laughs> no, no 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 i i, I feel like um like within that universe, like there aren't enough people copying to like confusion. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like I would never, I would never have the balls to say, or like that it would never occur to me to be like, oh yeah, I get this. Like I'm gonna move on to. I, I feel like something like this, <laughs> difference in repetition. I'm gonna have this forever, and maybe at various points in my life, one or two things about it will make sense. And like mm-hmm. I'm perfect, I'm perfectly content with that. Totally. I mean, is that something I should scope out or should I continue I, I, maybe. being a naysayer? No, it's all gobbledygook to me so far. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I'm being honest, you know, like I'm sort of at a more like intermediate level, you know, I spend time with like Paglia. That shit makes a lot of sense to me, you know, but it's also like very plain spoken, you know, like I, I gave Adorno a lot of my life and mm. it, it's begun to make sense. You know, that Jacques Attali book makes sense to me. And, you know, I think I want to begin now to understand things on a more esoteric level mm-hmm. stuff's like very practical like economic based stuff you know totally see that's that's more my world and like I, i'm still not uh learn learn it on economics by any means but uh mm-hmm. like that's i feel like that is well it's still totally not concrete like it's like not a science it's, it's still more interesting to me and actually uh, it's kind of funny like i don't know if you uh agree with this but i was talking to uh i mean i've like everybody I talk to, I bring this up with, but like, if you look at like a stock market chart, like I like to do like technical analysis with cryptocurrencies and stuff. And it's like, it's musical analysis. It's just uh-huh. on a super huge scale because you're dealing with like this day is essentially a pitch of this amplitude um, right? in some ways. I mean, obviously not, but um, it's a, a giant waveform and like, that's what we deal with. So uh-huh. are, um, are you, are you a, are you a crypto bro? I mean, I, I don't think, 
a crypto bro, but I, <laughs> um, I, I like cryptography. I like the cypherpunk uh, movement. I yeah, like, yeah, yeah. uh, you know, that type of stuff, but you know, I'm, I don't have a, a Ferrari. My last name is Lamberton, but I don't have a Lambo. Right, 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 right. <laughs> For some reason, I wrote down your name the other day as Lumberton, and then I was like, oh, that's the town in, um, in Blue Velvet. <laughs> is it? Yeah, it's the town where the, the, the movie takes place. In. I just anyway. watched that like a month ago, too. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I'm curious to talk a little bit about Breathwork, too, because you mentioned mm-hmm. that with uh, Mario's uh, piece. Yeah. And I'm also curious what type of lentils you like as that's your comfort food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, generally, I'll, I'll default to green lentils uh, simply because they don't cook as fast. And you, by virtue of the fact that they don't cook as fast, I feel like you can sort of imbue all kinds of like more flavor more uh, easily. And I don't like, you know, whether I'm cooking beans or lentils. And I feel like this is kind of a chef thing where like, you know, you can judge a chef. You're vegan, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but you can judge a chef by like how they roast a chicken. Okay. You know, you can judge a chef by like their cachoe pepe. I feel like legumes are similar. Um, and you can, I actually had dinner the other night with Mario and Toby and I was showing, we went, I took, it was like, I picked a place and I, I showed, we had these, these, uh, butter beans and I picked up a bean and I was like, you see the chef cooked this perfectly. Like it's perfectly round it maintains its, stru- its structure. And when you bite into it, it's just creamy. You know, the beans aren't broken mm. and like leaking. And so I, like with lentils, like, you know, if I'm making like a dal or, or, you know, um, you know, sure. Red lentils, you know, are really nice, but ultimately like, I like green lentils that, you know, you can build like a, you know, like a mirepoix, some white wine, uh, maybe some like anchovy, which, you know, you wouldn't do, but, um, you can sort of maintain the structure of the lentil itself. Um, and really get like some pretty deep kind of like bone satisfying flavors in there. Um, you know, like really fragrant. Uh, I made some lentils the other day that were like, you know, false modesty aside, they were like, <sighs> um, I love me some lentils, but I'm just like yeah. a, a salt and fat guy. <laughs> yeah. But what do you use? Like, so olive oil or like, what's your vegan uh, fat? Like coconut oil or yeah, yeah. mostly coconut oil. I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, so another funny thing, like I, I'm actually just skipping past the whole breath work thing. We'll come oh, back we can to go back to it. I, I just, uh, I did a breath work session the other day that was, Awesome. But, uh, yeah, but wait, go ahead. So, uh, lentils, uh, boom, 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 boom. Shit, did I lose it? Um, lentils, fat, coconut oil. Shit, I might have lost it. Um, well, we'll come back to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, parts, uh, what was I gonna say? What, the breath work? Not about lentils. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. What about that? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I got it. Um, so when I heard your thing with Tyshawn and when I heard your thing with Justin, um, both of them, I feel like pizza came up so much, mm-hmm. and um, like that's just like a, a thing that's totally foreign to me as like a, an Angelino. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, and you know, you're like New York native since however long. Um, and I just like in my world, I'm like, I feel like the whole thing would be like, oh yeah, this place is where you can get the most restricted dietary options. Sure, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, for yeah. you, like this is the best pizza. I'm like. What your fucking carbs and tomato sauce? Uh, it's like, man. Well, no, no. I mean, like a class. So I think, uh, and I've gone on the record as saying this many times, and I'll say it again. Like, in my opinion, the best pizza in the United States is in New Haven, Connecticut. Okay. New Haven has a tradition of pizza. I mean, there's you know, people think about Connecticut. Like, have you spent much time on the East Coast? Not much, no. Okay. I mean, you know, people. I feel like the general perception of Connecticut is like. Greenwich, Connecticut, WASP, you know, 1%, mm-hmm. you know, elite power structure people live, you know, and that's like a very small part of Connecticut. Connecticut is by and large occupied by like a uh, pretty, uh, not to sound, you know, not, I don't, I don't say this like pejoratively, but I also do like sort of lowbrow, like Italian, like working class people. You know, that's, that's who it is. And so there's a culture of like Italian, like Italian American food in, in Connecticut, New Haven specifically, that is like, when you think about like that red sauce shit, you know, people, I have a whole thing with Italian food too, that, you know, I'm going to try not to like, (laughs) um, you know, American Italian food is very different from, you know, Italy is a very large country. Let's just say Mm -hmm. that. So 
something that you get in like Trentino Alto Adige has nothing in common with something you get in like fucking Sicily or, you know, Puglia or something. Um, but the, you know, the red sauce tradition of American Italian food, I think New Haven's got that shit on lock. And, a, you know, so they don't even call it pizza. They call it a pizza. Hmm. And a classic New Haven a pizza is just a uh, crust tomato sauce. And if you're feeling crazy, like some grated Parmesan, but you don't need it. So it's actually vegan by default. Interesting. Um, you know, really what you're dealing with are, you know, multi-generational, you know, pizzaiolos who are, have been working with the same ovens their family's been working with for 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I see a very clear parallel between something like that and, you know, the rigor of, of music making and sort of devoting yourself to like a really specific craft and how did, so what was my point? So New Haven pizza, <laughs> wait, what was, yeah, yeah, anyway. Well, I mean, there's something to be said about like the, like, you know, getting your hands dirty. I mean, probably clean, uh, like that sort of hands-on, like yeah. culinary thing that um, like, you know, like for instance with coffee, like an intelligentsia, I feel like has like gotten so polished and like, it's kind right. of like, it assumes that it's the best. And then like, you go to some little shithole where, or like, you know, someplace that you would, uh, a snotty barista would call a shithole. And it's like, this is actually really delicious. And it's because like, you've like, you can't fuck it up because you have like skin in the game and like, yeah. you know, they have to make it delicious. And I feel like I respect that, but, um, I just, I have like orthorexic tendencies about, uh, my, my foods. <laughs> well, but it's also, you know, like, let's not forget, you know, context, 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 you know, mm -hmm. I, the, the best beer I ever had in my entire life. I will, the day I die, I'll still remember this beer that I had was, um, it was a very long, stressful day. There was a horrendous like snowstorm in New York. And my wife and I had a trip to Costa Rica. We were the only plane to leave uh, JFK that day. The only plane. Long, crazy day of travel. Got to Costa Rica late at night. I sat on top of this roof and I opened up. Imper the only beer you get down there is Imperial, which is like probably comparable to like Miller High Life. And after this crazy long day of travel, I opened up the Imperial and I heard the ocean beside me and I drank the whole thing in one shot and I, was, I closed my eyes. I can still taste that beer. I can mm. still feel like the ocean air on my skin. And there is no fucking wise ass, you know, IPA that tastes like, you know, a tropical fruit that's ever going to take the place that, that beer has for me, ever. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? No, no, like. So, you know, coffee, pizza, like, you know, there's plenty of people, you know, there's all these like high tech, you know, pizza makers in New York now that are using like only crazy imported ingredients and a pie costs like $30 and it's, you know, this big and it's, yeah, it's cool. It's cool. It's good. But I want, that's not what I want. You know, I, I want, I want to go to Sally's in New Haven and have some fucking, you know, illiterate Trump supporter making the pies. <laughs> You know, and he literally knows how to do one thing well, and it's make pies. That's kind. Of, that's that's more my scene. You know, illiterate Trump supporter cuisine. Um, yeah, interesting. Okay. Um. Well, I guess we can talk about breathwork again now that sure, we yeah. like got our culinary uh, um, claims out. Uh. So I mean, I feel like wait, for, wait, real quick, uh, real quick. Some motherfucker got mad at me because uh, there's this sandwich shop deep in Brooklyn called uh, DeFonte's, which I think, like, without question, the best sandwiches in the world. This is the roast beef, roast beef place. Bravo. Exactly. Uh, the, uh, I was talking this, I was telling someone, I was like, you know DeFonte's is going to be slamming because when you show up, that's like where all the cops are eating. And they were like, what? How dare you? How dare? I was like, no, you don't understand. Like, we're talking real New York food. Go to where like the old school like Italian cops are eating. Like it's incontrovertible that it's gonna be the best food. Anyway. <laughs> but like they interpreted it as like this, you know, blue lives matter thing. It's like that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is yeah. these guys know sandwiches. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if somebody like needs to get some food on the job, then it it probably is going to be good. Um yeah. yeah. Um I'm curious about this uh breathwork session that was uh game changing though. Yeah, so I mean, are you familiar with like with breathwork or like what what that entails? I mean, like, so I uh, like for a while I was doing like you know breath apnea training or apnea breath yeah. training or whatever, like to like you know get longer breath holds. I've sort of fallen off with that, um, and I'm hip to like the the Wim Hof and like the holotropic stuff, and like yep. I've sort of tried to like 
take the whole holotropic thing and like run with that term um just as like a a way to avoid saying psychedelic um right but i mean beyond that like i haven't like done it super formally but uh i i'm i'm hip to it yeah i mean so all right so you know mario's a deer friend and um you know we have pretty like pretty intense personal conversations uh and he's definitely someone that like your your thing just got really crackly by the way i don't know if, oh, shit. but um I don't, I don't want to like derail. There it is. Good. Um, I had this really uh, last summer, not, not the one that just passed, but 2020, uh, a very, very deeply traumatic experience. Um, and it like really, uh, I'm trying to think if I should tell you what happened. Um, I, I, I had an experience that, you know, was very traumatic. It was far more traumatic than I would have anticipated. That is to say that about a week after this thing happened, just all this crazy, like all, um, all this stuff was like coming at me mentally and emotionally that I, I did not have, I didn't know where it was coming from. I thought, I thought it was going crazy. I thought I, I, uh, uh, sorry if I'm like, um, so I, I called up Mario. And I said, "Look, man, I got to talk. Like, I need some help right now." And I explained to him what was happening, what I was going through, and he was like, "You gotta, you gotta call this person, that Alice that I, that I, I studied breath work with for years. Like, I, this is now's the time." And basically, I went to this this person. Um, I explained to her what had just happened uh, and what I was going through. And what I said to her is because you know I'd done therapy, like talk therapy, at many times in my life, um, and and I, I don't have any interest in that shit at all anymore. You know, and what I told her is like, look, I I know what I'm dealing with in terms of childhood trauma. I know what I'm dealing with in terms of like generational trauma um, that you inherit from. And I'm happy to like talk about that stuff to lay groundwork with you. I don't want to talk about, and I don't want to find about things that I already know. I don't want to talk and find out about things that I already know that I know. I want to like look at stuff that um that I don't know that I don't know because the thoughts that I'm having things that are coming coming at me um i don't have any i don't know what i'm dealing with so what this woman does um and uh, is it's it's essentially like like fully integrative therapy so we talk for a while and then she sort of we do these breath exercises um to focus on parts of the body that are being impacted by whatever um emotional trauma impact weight that you're dealing with you do the breath exercises and then you kind of come out of it and she asks, you know, like what you experienced during those exercises. And then you sort of do it again and you, she kind of guides it a little bit and you do, so you do like an interval like that, like two or three times. And just without question, um, every session I have with her is transformative. You know, the talk is, is, um, it's helpful, you know, and it's just like talking to like a really wise friend who, you know, has good perspective, but, she knows how you know after decades of doing this stuff how to guide these breath exercises that like every single time something gets like jarred loose and it and it it's um you know the conversation we were having the other day and like you know i don't know if this is like too like personal for this type of podcast but like you know i'm um i i mentioned i quit drinking and you know i've 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 been doing like the aa thing and i've been you know kind of really trying to explore this through like a um like a prescribed path and you know what i told her was that look you know something that's come up the first week i i, I did without drinking every evening at around seven o'clock i would start feeling this like rawness this like and my heart would just like i start weeping and my heart like my chest just like like would ache and what i i told her was like i i realized that there's just this pain that's there and clearly the alcohol has been you know I've, has kept me at like some safe distance from it so now that i'm not you know getting you know not not drink you know stopping you know putting down the bottle is like the easy part you know for me anyway. but like inviting that pain in closer and just realizing okay i guess you know i live with pain you know like this isn't like i'm not gonna fix this i'm not gonna fucking you know hit a switch you know so now the challenge is like 
living with with pain and you know so we'll do these breath exercises that you know i don't know i'm, I'm kind of like talking all over the place but like um just what i need to live with this stuff in a healthy way becomes clearer and it can be very concrete things you know like comfort like um uh, how i what I surround myself with, what I, um, being really like cognizant of what I need, you know, I, I sound, I, sorry, I, I don't mean to sound like some new age, like no, self-help no, no, yeah. guy, but, um, when you did talk about the big guy, well, yeah, I mean, the big guy is important to me, <laughs> the big man. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's like an age thing. You know, now that I'm like in my 40s, you know, I guess this is like shit that just like starts coming at you. But with within the breath work, I have found um, just like a really great sense of of peace with myself that I haven't known before. Yeah. You know, I'm still a fucking psycho. I'm still like a disaster, but um, it, it's helping me like um, have a. Uh, a heightened sense of compassion, um, not just for others and, you know, but like for myself, which is, you know, historically been very hard. for me. Absolutely. Hearing you talk about it, um, like here and, you know, previously, like it reminds me that like I should get back to that shit because like there are definitely times where I can feel that I have more capacity in terms of compassion or uh, patience right now. Yep. Um, when I am regularly doing breath work, but like, I feel like, you know, like, uh, I have some like physical ailments that I've like been sorting out and like once they're sort of basically gone then you're like okay I don't have to sort them out anymore and then they come back and you're like ah oh, shit like they came back and so like if you don't keep up some sort of minimal practice then they they come back but if you uh like I feel like I have a lot easier of time being like I'm going all in now and then like, right I solve something and then I forget about it and come back and so like yeah I need to be a little I think that's the natural course, you know, and like, I don't, you know, like the drinking thing, like, I'm not, I'm not saying like, I'm never going to drink again, but I'm, I'm using a, this time right now to, you know, kind of have like a greater sense of presence and, um, whatever. I don't I know. That might sound cliche, but like, it's, yeah, yeah. The breath work for me has been the most transformative thing I've done for myself outside of music. Um, yeah. What what type of a uh, like is there a specific type of breath work that Alice does, or um, is it just kind of like she feels out what she needs and it's like no, she's a full bag. Uh, I'm again, you know, as I said at the start of this conversation, I, I'm gonna. I, I, I heard, heard, yeah, I would say anybody that wants to look her up, the name of the group is One Breath Circle. Um, she's amazing. She, she does Zoom sessions, so if you're not you know nearby, you know you can you can you can do those, but like. Yeah, uh, you you can look her up. You know, I, I don't want to I don't want to speak for her. You know, bona fides or whatever. Um, I think I said that right. Bona fides. Um, heard. Well, uh, I, I want to keep on pushing you into uh, uh, trauma territory or anything. Um, yeah, no, I'll talk about it. I, I'm curious. Uh, so, I mean, you said you no longer doing the five hundred four nine podcast. Um, no. Are you still doing that label? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I put out all my stuff through it, so. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, no. I, I. I. It's funny, man. I have the. I actually have the itch to podcast again. I want to. Po I. I actually love podcasting. I just don't know what the fuck I would podcast about. Hmm. Like your 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 thing, kind of. You talk to all kinds of people, right? I mean, like I feel like I'm finding that when I talk to musicians, it ends up a lot better. But um, initially, the idea was to talk to like everybody. Um, in my like sort of catch like my catchphrase I'm going with is like. Uh, music, mind, and magic. Like, yes. I like, sort of dabble in the esoteric, but um, sort of also like, like, I like talking to people that know about consciousness shit, but like, mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, it's like, I, I'm kind of only an expert about music and coffee. <laughs> so, like, uh, gotta talk about those. And I'm, I'm tired of talking to coffee people. Um, yeah. I talk to like yeah. three or four. And, um, you know, if somebody can do the physics, like, I talk to this dude that's into like the physics of filter coffee, and it's super interesting, but, um, it's getting so so high tech and stuff that now it's like unless you have a PhD in physics you can't really keep up. So I'm like I, I can't do it. <laughs> right, 
right, right, right, right. Um, so I'm I'm curious though, uh, what what do you think like a label or an imprint really means these days? And um, I'm sort of curious if you have any thought on like NFTs, if uh, that's anything that tickles your fancy. No, I don't even know what the fuck they are. Like I know it stands for like non fung non fungible token. Mm -hmm. Um, I no, I'm not I'm not smart enough to really even understand what the concept is yeah. uh the terminology makes it like kind of like a barrier of entry um it kind of seems like a ponzi scheme or something i, I think that it's it, there's so much like cool stuff that will come out of it but right yeah. now it's like yeah it's, it seems like money laundering basically like it's like right oh, yeah you're selling gifts for uh like you know uh, just like little jpegs or whatever for like a million dollars are you kidding me that's just money laundering but uh I feel like there is some really interesting stuff that could come out of it. Like, yeah. Um, in terms of like, you know, sort of like taking Spotify out of the equation algorithmically. Yes. Like we have, we have the ability to do that. Like we don't need Spotify. No, no, no. I, um, okay. So what is the value of a label or imprint? I mean, I think, you know, historically it was the only way to get your stuff out there. And, you know, it's kind of funny to think, you know, if you think about the way the music business is now, which is a fucking joke, but if you think about like, you know, the like classic stereotype of like a cigar chomping, you know, music executive, mm -hmm. you know, it's really easy to sort of be dismissive of that or even, you know, disgusted by it. But, you know, there's something to be said for those cigar chompers because thanks to those cigar chompers, we have Ornette Coleman, we have John Coltrane, and we have, you know, Jimi Hendrix, and we have Pink Floyd, and we have all this, like, incredible music that, you know, found its way to this massive stage, you know, through those, those channels. And obviously, I mean, are, are you a Mark Fisher guy? Uh, not, not really. I'm, like, into that general world yeah like uh, mark fisher's never landed for me but okay uh, uh, I, I know plenty of people that love him so um go well, on. I, well i mean one, one thing i'm like really sort of in tune with with mark fisher is like being immediately distrustful slash dismissive of any kind of like poptimism you know and like i i, I you know i think it was like yesterday or the day before people online were all pissed off about um uh pitchfork has decided to revise their 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 reviews of certain records that they had like shit on in the past. Um, and if, but, so I was looking at pitchfork for the first time in years and it's like, what the fuck is this website? It's just, it's just like weird pop and like hip hop that, you know, I mean, I don't want to sound like, like an elitist, but I don't really see this as being like particularly interesting music, you know, Solange or whatever, you know, I'm, maybe I'm missing something, but so it seems to me like a label these days, is has more in common with sounds so dumb but like just it's just it's 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 just like cynical business like that the, that that aspect of introducing the world to the ornettes like it, it's just completely done it's you know branding deals and it's you know it's just it so for people like us you know i, I mean i i put everything out on a label called 5049 records and all that is really is like a stamp to put on the, you know, the back of the CD. Like, I, I don't know that it gives me any clout. It, I don't think it does, but I don't know that any label that would be putting out this kind of music is going to do anything better or differently than I can. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't have a smart answer. Like, I mean, it seems like if people aren't, using Bandcamp to their advantage, they're missing out. Like independent artists, like Bandcamp is really phenomenal. And um I mean I guess, you know, like five five zero four nine, you know, as much as I'm loath to use this word or to put it this way, like there's like some branding involved. And you know, I did a podcast for a number of years and helped bring attention to the thing. And uh I, you know, I've put out, I think, 11 records on the label. They're all, I've never put out a record by another artist. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's not important to have a label. Um, when you were talking about the, the Bean Dinner Night uh, with Mario, you said Toby, right? Yeah. That's like Toby Driver? Yeah, exactly. I think uh, I saw him do some sort of like 
you know, like tweet storm rant about like, you know, like Spotify and like yeah. kind of like, you know, let's all fucking jump ship together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, it does occur to me that like there's something different about the independent artist and like the mainstream artist where like we need a different whole world than like all these people that are just like super popular. And that seems to me where like the NFT thing comes in because like there's so much like power to like together and have a coherent sort of cooperative thing Mm -hmm. like it makes me think of like the gamestop thing where it's like Mm -hmm. these little nerds on reddit fucking got rich at the expense of hedge fund people because they were like cooperative and like organized and it wasn't even like a big deal it was just like casual and Mm -hmm. so um that seems like a a cool way to just be like yeah like independent musicians can unite and have some sort of connection in a a good way but i mean like of course nobody's gonna be like yes let's all jump ship at the same time to band camp but like, yeah, I mean, it does definitely have our interests, uh, you know, at heart a lot more than other places. Well, I, I feel like, you know, there was a, you know, how old are you? Uh, 33. 33. I mean, there was, you know, I remember as like a teenager, you know, if you wanted to go buy a CD, you know, so this is like the early mid nineties, you know, you could go to like the independent stores and find the cool shit. But if you went to Walmart, you know, that had a CD section, it was only going to be what, you know, uh, you know, fucking Creed or whatever was like insanely platinum selling artists. So it was just understood that you don't go to Walmart for cool, interesting music, you know, whatever that might be. And I feel like Spotify is the Walmart of music. And yeah, people like us just shouldn't even engage them at all. And like, it would require some, you know, general collectivist sentiment and like genuine like belief in in some kind of collectivism and you know i so some of the records i've put out i've intentionally not put on spotify mm-hmm. uh one just because like my my like stubborn sensibility says fuck spotify that that that's a platform that's not good enough for this music mm-hmm. but also part of me that's like i just want to see what the difference like if i put something on spotify like i have one record on my label that's on spotify I'll put another one that's not on Spotify and just sort of observe how they do in the quote unquote marketplace, what kind of reviews they get, uh, what kind of snowball of, you know, career stuff might happen. And quite frankly, you know, at the level level that I'm at, like I haven't seen Spotify be helpful in any way. Um, there's no reason to have my music. on Spotify. It's, it's helpful to have my music on Spotify so that I can share it with my civilian normie. Friends. <laughs> yeah. That's where it's helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, financially forget about it. You know, I mean, they are pirates. Don't get it twisted. There's no other, you know, they're, they're not it. Spotify ultimately best serves the people who cannot wait to step over their, their fucking peers. That's who it's for. You know, it is completely anti-collectivist. It is the biggest carrot, you know, to be dangled in front of it. I mean, gen- I mean, they're doing this shit now where like, I mean, they started doing the thing where you could pay them to get put on playlists. Yeah, it's insane. Now they're doing a thing where they want you to pay for your new music to show up if they search your name. Like it's it's just absolutely disgusting. Yeah. Um. And yeah, I I think, but yeah, I think you know, like like Toby, for 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 people to jump ship and have it be meaningful, like there does have to be something that resembles like union mm-hmm. mentality where we all say at one time we're not showing up for this and it could be meaningful. Um, I don't use Spotify. I don't, I don't fuck with that shit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I keep on calling it aesthetic climate change. Cause it's just like, it's, it's like litter everywhere. Like I can't find a fucking coal train thing like back when I would use it because it's like the best of coal train. Like here, right. here's everybody playing coal train. It's like, dude, Jesus Christ. Like, you know, I just, uh, I mean, yeah, well, I mean if, if you want to, if you want to, I was explaining this to, you know, to a friend of mine the other day who's like, I was like, look, if you want to understand like late stage capitalism very easily, just look to Spotify. It's literally, you know, I, I mean, Spotify is listed as one of the most competitive places to work. I, I know two people that work for Spotify and like, I don't begrudge them because they're like 20 something year old, mm-hmm. you know, women who went to like whatever bullshit liberal arts school um, and they're following that jive. But, you know, they, they tell me about these like work parties they have. They, they, they'll have staff parties where they'll have Beck do a private concert for the staff. It's like, so, so who's getting paid in this situation? 
the hundred fucking people that work for Spotify and Beck. Meanwhile, you know, the thousands, millions of other artists, you know, are there to build that for them. And it's, it's bullshit. You know, you can, if you can't figure out how to make money off of selling a thousand units of something, then, you know, you're an idiot. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you, you know, you'll have these movie studios that won't take a chance on a, you, you could guarantee a, a film studio. Like I have a project that's going to make you a million dollars. You're going to make a million dollars and they'll pass on it because they don't want the million dollars. They want, you know, a hundred million dollars. It's the same kind of like ass backwards thinking. And, you know, so yeah, you, you have to understand that if you are an artist that's putting your music on Spotify, you are choosing to be like a little femur bone in their catacomb pile of bones that supports the one or two things up top. It's yeah. It, the thing with the NFTs that is sort of exciting to me is that there's the potential to like control scarcity. Um, so like for instance, like you could have a self-destructing album or something like that. So it's like right. it's kind of like the Wu Tang album where it's like right. you're only gonna be able to listen to it if like you have access to it. And so. And who was it? Was Farmer Martin Shkreli, Farmer Bro, <laughs> <laughs> that bought it. <laughs> I, I want to say he recently sold it or something. Um, right. There's some. I don't follow that stuff, but uh, I mean, there's like that type of thing. If we could open source that type of thing to like allow artists to create, like to turn up the value knob on their thing, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, because um, if you can only have a thousand, you know, copies of something, um, and it's like protected <laughs> cryptographically, right? A lot of potential. Well, yeah, I mean, there's like, you know, like basic fundamental concepts of, of economics, you know, scarcity, supply and demand. And I, you are immediately, when you put something on Spotify, you are immediately declaring the value of it, which is zero. Yep. Uh, but not in like the generous way of giving a gift to somebody, of right. just saying, I want this to exist in the market, in the hopes, you know, that like same jive of exposure that people have been falling for, musicians have been falling for forever that's what it is mm -hmm. um and that you know the, the idea is they have you by the balls because you want people to hear your music yeah exactly but what's gonna you know you can get a licensing deal fucking mazda is gonna call you up and they're gonna put your fucking solo clarinet piece in a commercial like it ain't gonna happen i, I want to hear that uh uh Mitresco piece on a Nokia commercial or a exactly <laughs> exactly yeah uh, uh well apparently Two hours here. I feel right like there on. was like one or two things I wanted to holler at you about. Um, um, I mean, I guess like the the diatribes against Spotify is a good way to sort of wrap up. I mean, I'm curious if you just have any um, pieces of wisdom as a podcast host and a record label uh, runner. Mm -hmm. uh, for somebody that is doing the same thing or for somebody like me that's doing that thing mm -hmm. podcasting i would say there's a couple fundamentals that you got to follow one is consistency in your output not like i mean quality yes but like how often you actually put it out because mm -hmm. um, if you aren't putting it out consistently um with like you know people know they can get it every monday or every second monday or whatever like you've already sort of lost a little bit like that's that's podcast culture it needs to happen regularly so consistency of like the rate that it comes out specifically yeah like the, yeah, yeah, yeah consistency of like length or anything too or uh both both i always think it's weird when you like check out a podcast and one episode's two hours and another episode's 25 minutes like it's a little doesn't make sense to me uh but you know it has to come out at a, uh, at a consistent clip um i don't know avoid dead air uh you know just keep the conversation going no matter what you um don't receive usps uh deliveries whatever i mean i i actually love that podcasting the podcast that i enjoy listening to it becomes so like unprecious and i like aesthetically i actually prefer that i'd much rather listen to like you know come town or like red scare uh than you know this american life or something or serial that's like so polished and put together like a broadcast right you know like, fuck it, I don't, I don't want to hear, like, intro music. I don't even want to hear people introduce themselves. Yeah, I, I, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, so consistency of output, um, no dead air. <laughs> I mean, I, I think of it like zine culture, you know? 
Like I'd rather just it be unprecious and, you know, for me personally, and just like come out frequently and, you know, the shit that I'm really into, I'm like, you know, I look forward to it coming out, like, you know, mm -hmm. whenever it comes out. Um, and get cool people on, man. Call Mario. <laughs> cool. I mean, <laughs> I feel like I've, I've gotten a decent amount of like uh, interesting people so far. Yeah, no, um, definitely. Definitely. I really uh, enjoyed the coffee conversation with Daedalus. Oh, word. Cool, cool. You'll yeah. Yeah. Um, Dude, one of these guys that I have coming up uh, later this month. Actually, I just uh, uh, Nick McMaster just got back to me, so we're gonna do that in a few days. Yeah. But, um, there's this dude who teaches at University of Wisconsin who does exomusicology. Um, Bill Satheris or Satheris. It's man, he's a trip. Like his website is like, it's literally the study of space uh, or like alien music theory, basically. Whoa. Yeah, it's a trip. Uh, so it's gonna be. It's gonna be a weird one to. Yeah, I saw you talk to um, David Rothenberg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he makes music with like whales and insects and shit. Yeah, yeah, totally a trip. Yeah, yeah I mean that was a interesting one. Um, yeah, uh, I, I feel like I should have like actually talked about your album more, but Citadels and Sanctuaries is the name of the album out on Five Hundred Four Nine Records. Um, Scoop it. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I enjoyed listening to it and like. Uh, there's definitely like a lot of like nice uh, you know, uh, vibes coming through or harsh vibes, um, yeah, a man. lot of like you know, environments to inhabit. So um, I recommend everybody else check it out. I appreciate um, that. Uh, anything else you want to say before we wrap up? No, man, I really appreciated this. It was a lot of fun. Hey, dude. Great talking. Yeah, it's great talking. Uh, I'm going to be out there in November uh, playing a show on November 27th in LA. Nice. Uh, where at? Uh, it's called. Two 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 zero arts, two thousand two hundred twenty arts, something like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll email it to you. Cool. Yeah, yeah it's you gonna know. be cool. Yes. Yeah. Well, right on. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for talking, dude. It's awesome. Peace. Peace.